12 Angry Men is the fifth greatest film of all time on IMDb with a staggering score of 9.0 out of 10. It was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director and Best Screenplay at the Oscars and is considered by many to be a masterpiece. Yet, it is set in a single room, filmed entirely in black and white and is almost 70 years old. So what is all the hype about? To prepare for this episode, we have read hundreds of critics' reviews, rewatched and reanalyzed this film so that we can understand why this film is considered so great. By the end of this, we will also calculate a score to determine once and for all, is it really that good? Fred, <laughs> why don't you get us kicked off? What is 12 Angry Men? A writer's mission to create a perfect story. And did they did they do it? You know, I think it's about as close as it gets. Few reasons why. Simple. Simple concept. Simple technique. Executed in a way that is pleasing for everyone involved. Packaged in 90 minutes. In, out, within an afternoon. Now, we've had discussions on what a perfect film means for us whether that means that your favourite film has to be a perfect film, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't say my favourite film has to feel perfect. But there are some signifiers of what I would view as that categorization of perfection. And some of those are ne- neatly tied together. Like it is a, it feels like a morsel that you can just bite and it's, it's all wrapped up together within a short time span for me is is what I view as as a perfect film. Now, this is amongst five or ten that I've ever thought, wow, if there is any, it's this. It just is like a perfect sequential expression of an idea, meticulously meticulously, uh, expressed to us in a way that re-watching it, and now I've seen it about four or five times, if I have a break from watching this film, I can immediately remember all of the different characters, all of their different motivations, what they bring to the table, their, their, their voices, their, their appeals, their desires. And the way um, our boy Reginald Rose has crafted this so that everyone gets an input and everyone is even provided with an impetus is so neat. Like, it's just, it's just like, it's chef's kiss. Uh, I think it is up there in terms of the best package films ever. And unsurprisingly for me, it is the film that is oldest, that is as high as it is on IMDb. I literally couldn't agree more. It's not a film that I would expect to enjoy. And I think that basically it comes down to exactly what you said. It's packaged so nicely it's so discreet it just starts and ends when the movie starts and ends and it just knows what it's there to do i think that it's a perfect lesson for anybody who's taking up anything that involves crafting a story of any kind Mm. look at this film and analyze it under the question of does a brilliant story need to be complicated because this shows you it doesn't like mm. it really doesn't yeah you can make them complicated and they can still be great but you don't have to like this is such a simple neat idea it's just here are the stakes you get like scene two is like here are the stakes mm. here are the characters here is what's going to happen let's just do it and then 85 minutes later you're at the end and you're like well that is rewarding yeah. and satisfying and it's done and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we've we've gone through this before, right? And if you are enjoying how we speak about this, we we effectively wax lyrical about the way that it is constructed for a long, you know, a longer period, however long we spoke about this film an hour. Um there are a couple of gripes that mean unfortunately the ideal of a perfect film is still not realized in my eyes even though this this approaches it. Uh we we just barrel into spoilers. If you've watched, if people have watched Twelve spoilers. Angry Men, right? Yeah. So a couple of things that I am not as hot on: performances aren't across the board, out and out brilliant. Agreed. No, no, maybe just slightly dated. Some of them. Um, we mentioned this. Oh, I'll try not to do that all the time here. So apologies. You know, you've always said that 
you can quite clearly watch old films and see the aging of the acting. Yeah. You see how styles change. It's, it's a lot more jarring for you than I think it is for me. I view it with more nostalgia or, or appreciate it for its time. Sure. And I feel you've always seen it as objectively acting now compared to acting then. There, there's obviously been... The height of taken. acting then compared to the height of acting now just feels... Yeah. Some of the performances are really good. Like Henry Fonda's great, but you've got kind of the... The salesman who wants to go to the baseball game. The door. Yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot the about him. <laughs> you got. Um, he quite literally says. Duh. Yeah, he says. He's like, 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 <laughs> like what? Uh, Was that written on the page? The racist, classist guy. Uh, mm-hmm. A bit of a caricature. We actually had such a discussion on that how important it was to make them caricatures so that you can easily make 12 different people identifiable in in 90 minutes. So I'll forgive that. But performance-wise, Lee J. Cobb, I don't think it's his best, just his gruff. Lee J. Cobb, French Jacob, (laughs) his his gruff, um, antagonistic attitude was a bit bullish. It it was laid on a bit thick, wasn't it? Yeah, and... The way that he acts as the antagonist doesn't quite live up to our protagonist's nuance and um, creativity. And so it feels, particularly near the end, like maybe what um, Reginald Rose was going for doesn't quite get realised. Like, it's not win after win. Yes, just to what I mean by that is this is the setting. We've got the 12 men. We're going to introduce this idea of whether they are going to acquit or, or give the guilty verdict for this person on death row. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to set it up so that one person says not guilty. And over the course of this 90 minutes, he's going to sequentially be able to get everyone on side through a series of interesting elements of evidence. And that's that's the story there. Really interesting. Now, some of those turns from the people to get from guilty to not guilty are better executed than others. Absolutely. Some you're like, look, I know he has to find ways of doing it so that it's interesting and sequential. Not all of them live up to the heights of, of like the dagger going into the table. Yeah. Amazing scene. Some have more power than others. The, and this, some don't live up to scrutiny whatsoever. And rewatching it for like the, the fifth or sixth time now... I, again, I do feel like he, he, he is kind of just gaslighting a lot of them into thinking that there is room for doubt. Uh, no way. No, there is no. totally but, room for doubt. No, no. Yeah, I know, but it's more a case of there's definitely room for doubt, but the way he presents it is like, by the end, everyone is like, this guy's 100% not guilty, whereas yeah, 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 I think yeah, yeah, that maybe yeah, yeah. Yeah. he could still be guilty. I remember when we were coming up with segments for this film and I was like how short would this film be if they actually understood what reasonable doubt meant yeah. like it just the whole film is okay I'm going to stop us before we go too much further here because what we tend to do is say let's take this perfect film and figure out what we don't like about it oh this is incredible this one is so good so yeah I'll stop myself there this is a ridiculously good sure, film sure. it is so enjoyable to watch and yes when you have a sequence of 12 effectively reasonably not in the method but in the result predictable events yeah some are stronger and some are weaker and one of the things that makes us so great yes they're not all great but a couple of them are incredible yeah, so good like they are so and you feel strongly about the characters and so when each character has their turn and there is a good one because you feel intense amount of hate for a character or you feel really like really passionate about one or that it just when it lands oh my god it lands i mean you mentioned yeah. the knife one that is the obvious one mm. um but there are just there are a good handful of moments within this 90 minutes where you are just like holy shit this is awesome i'm so in, i'm so happy about that and i think that's what's so interesting about the the exercise of how this is written as the audience you know the destination Mm -hmm. we expect when we see the initial uh the initial scene of 
one person saying not guilty versus everyone. We suspect <laughs> that we are going to be at a point at the end of the film where everyone says not guilty. And so it all then becomes about the de- uh, the journey rather than the destination, mm-hmm. which makes it very interesting because he has to capture our attention throughout that process with us knowing what's going to happen. It's, it's almost like a, a magic trick where they reveal what they're going to do and uh, you don't know how they're going to do You know they're going, they're going to make it disappear, but you just... The art is actually in doing the it, process yeah. rather than the, the mean... Uh, sorry, the ends. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, were there any other points that you had in terms of how enjoyable this movie was or anything that made it especially impressive? So... Henry Fonda's performance is really great. Uh, yeah, the lead. Couldn't agree more. Yep, definitely. Uh, the dialogue is amazing. Incredible. So many of the lines are and just. I think the 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 setting is really awesome as well. Yeah, like I a real, love a real pot boiler. A real pot boiler. You, this I is can't believe the... we still haven't done that film. Is that on the top two hundred and fifty? Most yeah. definitely not. <laughs> hey, Valet is a pot boiler. Yeah, um, true. This is a pot boiler. This is and, probably the pot boiler. And I think that it it is the pot boiler. And I think that it benefits from the fact that I think that often, weirdly enough, in art, something that you might think of as a limitation is actually an amplifier for how good it is. And this is a good example of that. Like mm. you would think, oh, I'm going to have to watch people in a room for 90 minutes. That sounds miserable. But actually, the fact that they are trapped in that room is part of what makes it such an unusual and interesting and emotive experience. I'm pretty sure as well, the director was known for, during the production of this, actually just trapping everyone in there for like days right. and days and days to, to a bit of method acting yeah, basically method, they were just like let's just make them actually really annoyed at each other and get that tension really high and mm. it will translate into the movie so why do you think this is as high as it is on the top 250 i think that it is a perfect illustration of fundamentals mm. in an art form now, this is across any art form, but in cinema, get a good story with some good characters and some decent dialogue, mm. and you've got yourself a brilliant movie. Like, you don't really need to worry too much about it. A lot of people say, you know, one of the things that makes it great, for example, is Sidney Lumet's use of different lenses. And so, you know, you've got yeah. the scene where it will zoom really close on the old man's mm. face. And I disagree. I don't think that's what makes this film that good. I think that it's okay, it's fine, but what makes this film special is it just says, look at what fundamentals can do. Mm. And that's why this is such a special experience. Yeah, it's just an insanely well-crafted story. Yeah. And it's so simple in its scope that it is timeless. A lot of films of that period will have really well-developed stories for that era. But I think that because 12 Angry Men, it, it doesn't matter when you watch it. It doesn't age, really. That's 100%. probably why it's it's retained its place so high up. The, uh, the other one when we looked, which we will obviously get to at some point, that is the second highest for its age film. I'm going to just explain what I mean by that. There is no film higher than... Um, 12, 12 Angry Men that is older. Yes. So outside of the first film, the, 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 yeah. you, you start to go down. The second film that is older than 12 Angry Men that is In, next highest is It's a Wonderful Life. Which would be, do you know where it is on the... I think it's like 19th or 20th. Okay. So it's a bit of a gap. That also, the Christmas setting has an appeal which isn't going to age even though the the a the setting is aged yeah the setting's aged in 12 angry men but because it's there's always going to be some sort of it's aged massively in some regards it's in black and white when's the last film that was released in black and white like there are things that have aged and yet at its core it has not aged at all like the things that really matter haven't aged at all we'll end up watching the artist at some point actually which was in 2012 the black and white film that won the oscar for best picture that year right yeah it's a, okay. bit of a throwback film that yeah, yeah okay we'll silent as well well i got a fun little fact for you about this one okay 
Sidney Lumet's directorial debut, fe- feature length directorial really? debut. Yeah. So he was uh, directing TV series, and Henry Fonda and Reginald Rose decided to start this project together. Right. And Henry Fonda said, I want Sidney Lumet because he has a reputation for staying on budget and on time. And right. he did that. And so this was his first ever film. Okay. Talking about on budget and on time, then we spoke um, about the old reliance on. Um, well, not Reliance, but film being expensive back in the day. And so if a take was a bit imperfect, Mm. you just keep it in. And it's interesting watching older films in the digital age where you can re-record things and it's not an issue. Then there are a lot of like little very human, yeah, and it does add authenticity to those scenes. You you like them because you're like, oh, that's that's not supposed to be said. (laughs) It feels more realistic. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, some of the acting feels less realistic, so it takes away from it a bit. But it is quite nice to see something you definitely don't see nowadays. I think it makes it feel organic and real, yeah. and it doesn't doesn't. Again, it's about fundamentals. This film, like, it is literally just get your bloody character, dialogue, and plot right. Uh, mm. Like, don't make them special. Just get them right, and then the rest will just fall into place. Don't fuck around. Um, I mentioned that it was nominated mm-hmm. for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay. Oh, no, it's got Best Picture. But it didn't win any. Do you know what no. it lost out to? What, what year was it? 57? Mm-hmm. The, tr- ooh, uh, Bridge of the River Kwai. Certainly was. Yeah. yeah. Who won all of them? Yeah. yeah, that one absolutely swept up. Yeah. So there you go. But not as high on IMDb, so... Interesting. That, very in, in, very excited to see was. that one, though. Me too, me too. It's in the the right. section. <clears throat> it's in the the section. <laughs> Many the So it's going to be... <laughs> if they, if it, I don't know if we already mentioned this, but we are doing the IMDb Top 250 in alphabetical, alphabetical order. order. Uh, so feel free to join us on that. And... Uh, Looking really, we it, should take off the those, but that would just be oh, way just too be much too work. Fiddly. It would just be too complicated. So, uh, screenplay was written by Reginald Rose for TV. I believe there was some element of theatrical element to it as well, but it was the screen adaptation was for TV. Uh, Henry Fonda and Rose partnered to produce this film adaptation. Fonda selected him. They both, Reginald Rose and Henry Fonda, deferred their salaries on this because it didn't do well in the box office. Henry Fonda, in his autobiography, has blamed the distribution company because they didn't, when it did really well, they didn't release it to many theatres, but it did really, really well, and they didn't re-release it. Right. And so he was like, they didn't put any effort into marketing and they didn't re-release it when it did well. So it didn't make, it made a loss when it came right. out. Henry Fonda and Reginald Rose both deferred their payments, their salaries, and Henry Fonda's never been paid for this film. Right. And he wasn't just lead, he was producer. Yeah, and lead. he was executive producer as well. Wow. So pretty crazy that. Um, the cast includes three Oscar winners, Henry Fonda, Martin Balsam, and Ed Begley. Don't know which one that is. Martin Balsam is Jura One, who is, I believe, Jura One, who's in uh, Psycho. Yes. I think yeah. that's him. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, two Begley Oscar is. nominees. Lee J. Cobb. Lee J. Cobb. He's Cobb pretty famous. And uh, Jack Warden. Okay. So in a cast of 12, what the hell are they called? Jurors. In a cast of 12 jurors. <laughs> angry men. <laughs> in a cast of 12 angry individuals, you have five Oscar nominees, three of which won them. This is star-studded. Do you know how many had won at the time? I do you know Henry Fonda was double Oscar winner. Really? For, for two acting I want to watch some more of his stuff. I He's just, good, isn't, it, isn't it, it? I think there's another thing we haven't touched on about why this film is good is Henry Fonda is just so likable. The yeah. character and the performance, the way that he comes across, you just really like and respect the guy. And also there's the evil Henry Fonda alternative ending that they could have done. Yes. So tell me, what? how could this have ended differently? How could this film have been improved? The only way that I think they could have improved this film... <laughs> <laughs> Link in description for a longer form version of this story is if at the end, for anyone who doesn't know, Henry Fonda converts everyone to going not guilty through a series of um, not mental tricks, but he, he basically doesn't. I'm not going to say bends the evidence, but he makes them see that there's room for reasonable doubt in yes. almost every single piece of uh, key evidence that yep. was brought forward to trial. Uh, and then the first person who was. On his side was the old man. Attention, maybe. (laughs) 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 Who at the end, when they're leaving the courtroom, runs up to him and said, I never caught your name. And then he tells him his name is 
I forget the name. Do you remember? Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Davis. Davis. Okay. So and McArdle. D- Davis and McArdle. Well done. So, alternate ending. Davis goes to get the bus or get the train, gets his ticket out for his return journey. Name on the ticket, different name. So he was obviously lying about his name. What else was he lying about? A very minute change that then throws off everything we've learned and leads us to think, was he evil, Jura 8? And you know what? It points towards this being a good ending throughout the movie because there's a scene where they're in the bathroom and one of the jurors goes, well, I'm not one for supposing, but supposing you convinced us all out of this and he really did murder his father. He really did knife his father. Uh, And he's he's an architect. Yeah, which is is shady. Is he an architect? When someone tells me they're an architect, I immediately just go, "Mm." he managed to find the exact same knife in the neighborhood where the boy is from. So one thing that I was playing about with, with this alternate is if he has a surname, Maybe he's a cousin of the person. Yeah. On dry- I mean, probably quite hard to get them to be a drawer, but let's leave that aside. It would be fun. He's, he's a psycho. Um, I got a question for you. Go on. Do you think that the boy was innocent or not? Uh, guilty. Okay. Any reason why? Or you just, <laughs> are you just like Jorah too? <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> just one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... He was probably not guilty if we were to believe the actual story as it was laid out. The the point is he's probably not guilty, right? But the piece of evidence that annoys me the most that everyone just completely turned a blind eye to that, as you know, is... Well, I'm hoping you might say something different to me because what I'm thinking is the theatre going the to theater the cinema. One, it's like he went to the cinema in the middle of the night at like between 12 and 3 or something Yeah, insane. and then came back, couldn't remember any details He could whatsoever. not say what film he'd been. Like nothing, couldn't but remember But I suppose he could anything. have been lying about where he went yeah, to keep so, himself so safe. maybe he was lying about that, but still didn't remember anything. And you're like, okay, if they lent into that and said <laughs> it was because he was under complete emotional duress. Yeah. And you're like, okay, maybe. But I think the fact that they tried to point it out by getting the guy who doesn't sweat to perfectly detail the events of the previous <laughs> week, like verbatim, up until like last Tuesday. And then it was like, <laughs> who was the supporting actress in the double feature of a film you wanted two weeks ago? Weeks ago? And now he's suddenly like, I saw that film. It wasn't the marvelous Mrs. Bainbridge, it was the amazing Mrs. Bainbridge. Oh, you're right about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I know. Right. that was that was one of those. But so okay, so do we think that that is for us? If we were jurors, would we be hanging the jury because that is damning enough? Yes or no? Did he kill his dad? I would have gone. I would have gone not guilty. I would have gone guilty. You'd have gone guilty. <laughs> Perfect. Good. You don't Hung remember jury. what film you'd make a terrible podcast host. You don't remember what you don't even remember what film you watched. Yeah. You muppet. Right. Okay. Um. Who is your favourite juror? Aside from maybe juror eight, the main one. Two. Remind us which one two was. No, no, there are two. Oh, okay. <laughs> two was, it wasn't two, the, uh... well, I don't know about that, guys. Yeah, that would <laughs> no, be a weird one. He wouldn't be. Uh, juror number, oh, is it four? So Describe got... him. I'll remember the character and so will the audience. He's the guy who grew up in the slums. Yeah, okay. Really, I liked oh, him. That's, not, nice. that's an interesting one, okay. I, I actually... Three, I'm just remember. Juror number five, the one who's like, if you talk like that to him again, yeah, yeah. I'll lay you out. Yeah. And then, of course, juror number 11. <laughs> <laughs> juror number 11, the watchmaker. Yes. What gives you the right yeah, to yeah, mess yeah, yeah, with yeah, another yeah. man's life? <laughs> oh, he's incredible. I think he's probably the one for me. But then the only other one is Mikado. But I still don't think he's my favourite. So I think Swiss watchmaker... Is probably my favourite. Yeah, okay. And then the one who, it, the only one who says what we were all thinking, which was, if you don't shut up, I'm just going to lamp you. Yeah. <laughs> was like, quality. What a legend. And you know what? Not just a legend, but in a similar vein to my actual favourite, what a stand up guy. Yeah. Like, he was, he was, a was good just guy. there to be a decent, legitimate juror and a nice dude. And yeah. Like, good on you, man. A good working man. Yes. Any, uh, any other contenders? 
Nah, I think we've, we've <laughs> covered everyone interesting. I asked ChatGPT for some interesting questions. What snack would you bring? What snack would you bring? Yeah, if you were a juror your... for a death sentence, Jesus, what snack would you shite, bring? Isn't it? <laughs> what the fuck is that? It's the fifties as well. You gotta pick fifties snacks. Fifties snack. Fucking the end of a loaf of bread. Yeah, probably like a, a <laughs> butter butty or something. <laughs> Some liquor. Lard. <laughs> Lard in a pot. Would is there any situation in which this film would be better if it had a small amount of action in it at any point? Maybe, maybe he does lamp him. <laughs> that would be so good. I think the, in this case, the threat of action is better than actual action. Okay. Uh, the the other questions are, you thought the snack one was bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time to settle if this film justifies the hype. The score it has on IMDb is 9.0 out of 10. We're going to visit the Mate Night Machine. Ooh! Where we will press some knobs, twiddle some buttons. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Probably kick a fox. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost certainly. The main nine machine, we do what it tells it us. It sets the conditions and we just, yeah. we go in and then we come out with a score. With a pile of kicked foxes. <laughs> and it's correct. <laughs> and a correct and a, score, which as everyone knows. <laughs> and a dribbling hedgehog. <laughs> okay, we'll be back in a moment. Fox, the fox. The fox. <laughs> you, you're only supposed to kick it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, well, at least we've got a score. Yeah. Do you want to know what it is? <laughs> let me just... Let me just... The bloody main high score. There's wounded fox. Okay, yeah, so... On. Uh, 9.0 out of 10 on IMDb, which is... Electric. Let's be honest. A, a staggeringly high score. Mm. Like, that is very rare. We've put it into the main line machine. Woo, but we do. We've, we've done some questionable things. <laughs> <laughs> we have come out with a score. Once and for all, 12 Angry Men with a grand total of 8.84 out of 10. Oh, that is. Is it high. the fifth greatest film of all time? I don't know if it necessarily is, but it's definitely one of the greatest. Get, you of all know, time. What, when you're getting that high. You're in contention. It's you? a little bit about what day you're on. Yeah, eight point eight four is is hot. Yeah, that is hot stuff. I think probably what held it back a little bit is just like you know, it's not exactly the most challenging visual uh, endeavor for the director. Mm. You know, again, sound like it's not exactly got the Star Wars score or any kind of real important element of. Yeah, you know, what I mean, There's but for just, that reason as well, that did it, it did stand the test of time because a lot of those things so do true. date. Like music, maybe less so, but certainly visual, big visual things tend to date quite, quite dramatically. So, so this is like still indicative of a very, very high score, which is unsurprising. Well, if you got it this far, thank you so much for listening, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we will see you on the road to Cannes. Road to Cannes, episode two. Nice one. Twelve years a slave. <laughs>